This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We're continuing to look at the rise of neo-Nazis in America in the wake of the Pittsburgh synagogue massacre and a spade of hate-fueled killings in the U.S. in recent weeks. Still with us is A.C. Thompson, correspondent for Frontline PBS and the reporter for ProPublica. His investigation, Documenting Hate, New American Nazis, premieres tonight on PBS stations and online at pbs.org slash frontline. In his investigation, Thompson spoke with Professor Kathleen Ballou author of Bring the War Home, the White Power Movement and Paramilitary America, on links between the military and Adam Waffen. We're looking at a current group called the Adam Waffen Division, and they are actively recruiting military members. Does that surprise you? Not at all. That's a strategy pioneered by the White Power Movement in the period of my study and continued throughout the post-Vietnam period. One thing to understand is that throughout American history, there's always a correlation between the aftermath of warfare and this kind of vigilante and revolutionary white power violence. So if you look, for instance, at the surges in Ku Klux Klan membership, they align more consistently with the return of veterans from combat and the aftermath of war than they do with anti-immigration, populism, economic hardship, or any of the other factors that historians have typically used to explain them nationalist fervor, populist movements, those are all worse predictors than the aftermath of war. periods tend to correspond, then, with, with an upsurge in white power, white supremacist activity. Always. Yes. Wow. Ballou outlines a long history of military men who became key figures in the white power movement. George Lincoln Rockwell, World War II veteran and founder of the American Nazi Party. Richard Butler, World War II veteran and founder of the Aryan Nations. Louis Beam, Vietnam veteran and Grand Dragon of the KKK. Timothy McVeigh, Gulf War veteran and Oklahoma City bomber. It's important to remember, too, that returning veterans that join this movement and active duty troops, we're talking about a tiny, not even statistically significant percentage of veterans. But within this movement, those people who did serve are playing an enormously important role um, in instruction of weapons, in creating paramilitary activist um, mentality and training. When we speak to people involved in, in this movement today, they talk about leaderless resistance. Can you explain that to me? Sure. Leaderless resistance is basically what we would understand today as cell-style terrorism. The idea that you can recruit a small number of committed activists, organize them, and then they will behave on their own in a cell without direct ties with movement leadership. If we think, for instance, about the Oklahoma City bombing, Timothy McVeigh is sort of the ideal soldier of leaderless resistance. He's in an um, infantry unit and serves in the Gulf and is involved in white power groups while he's on post. He's consistently involved in this movement right up to the moment of the Oklahoma City bombing. We know that this is part of the white power movement and an act of leaderless resistance. But we have this memory of that as an act of one person. And as a result, I think we've never really delivered a decisive stop to this activism. That because we don't understand Oklahoma City as being an outgrowth of an organized movement that it has been around for decades, that is modeling the military, that is involving military members, that the authorities have never really been able to put a stop to it. That's right. The military response to white power activism, like the court response to white power activism and the police response to white power activism, reflects the many ways that our society has not been prepared to deal with this kind of a movement. That was Professor Kathleen Ballou speaking with A.C. Thompson. A.C., why, why is it then that the, uh, the military and the, and the federal government and its counterterrorism efforts uh, places such so little attention of, all, of the billions of dollars that they spent on counterterrorism dealing with homegrown uh, right-wing extremist terrorism? You know, I, that's a great question, and I don't think anybody really knows the full answer to that. I think one thing that we should say is that there has been more aggressive uh, action from the FBI and the Department of Justice recently on this front. So we saw eight white supremacists involved in the Rise Above movement uh, who uh, were active in Charlottesville and at other protests recently get arrested on rioting charges. We see the FBI looking uh, at this connection between Adam Waffen and the Pittsburgh massacre. But I think in general, 
there has been this massive turn towards uh, focusing on 9-11 style terrorism and this sort of like sense that the white supremacist anti-government terrorism embodied by people like Tim McVeigh, embodied by people like Wade Page, who was a neo-Nazi who uh, went into a Sikh temple in Wisconsin and killed six worshipers, that that is not that important. And I think that there's been a sort of loss of the expertise on white supremacist terrorism within the federal government, that everything now is uh, jihadi-style terrorism, and that's what people focus on. And so, so people don't remember, don't have the institutional knowledge to go after the white supremacists. Um, A.C. Thompson, uh, for this report, you interviewed a member of Adam Waffen, well-named, you call him John. Um, you disguise his voice, um, his face is blurred. This is a clip. Back in New York, our Adam Waffen source, John, agreed to talk over video chat with me and my colleague Ali Winston. So I'm walking the division so a uh, Nazi extremist group seeking to spread terror. The main thing is lone wolf activity. When you say lone wolf attacks, it sounds to me like you're talking about basically terrorist acts. Yeah, they don't see themselves as terrorists, rather they see the United States as the ultimate terrorist. Like what Adolf Hitler said, how do you meet terrorism? You meet it with stronger terrorism. Adam Waffen is made up of about 60 guys, and then you have what is called initiates. That guys were in the process of becoming members, and in order to become a member, you have to prove yourself. So how many initiates would you say there, there are? Or were. Or were. <sighs> when I left, there was more initiates than there were members. So wow. That's anything. All it takes is one guy to snap and to do something like that. That's what Dylan Roof said. I'm tired of saying nothing but in the white nationalist community, so I'm going to take a stand and I'm going to go into church and I'm going to kill all these black people because no one else is doing anything. But who knows? There could be another Dylan Roof and Adam Waffen. Dylan Roof, of course, is the um, young man who opened fire in the uh, AME church, the Manual Church in Charleston, gunning down African American worshipers as well as uh, their minister. Um, A.C. Thompson, you disguise uh, John's face, his voice. I mean, this journey you go on, confronting white supremacists or those who want to talk about them, is dangerous for yourself as well. But if you can tell us who John is, how you found him, and then when you find James Mason, him talking about Trump emboldening these people. Yeah, I mean, what I should say about John is the reason that John's voice his disguised, his identity is disguised. And same with the other former Adam Waffen member that we interview in the film, is they're not scared of the authorities. They're not scared of the public. They're scared of other uh, current Adam Waffen members coming after them or their families and killing them. That's why they're disguised. And that's the sort of fear that people have about talking about these groups when they've been inside these terror organizations. We went out to Texas because Adam Waffen's currently sort of driven from a cell of people in Texas. Houston, Texas. There's a young man named John Cameron Denton. He goes by the online handle Rape. Everyone in the group calls him Rape. And we uh, confronted him out at a black metal, heavy metal festival in Houston and said basically like, hey, you know, you're talking about killing people all the time. You're making threats to people online. You're celebrating mass murder. Uh, we'd love to interview you about your uh, views. He didn't want to talk, but we did eventually um, get the guy, James Mason, who's sort of been the inspiration for this group, who's an advisor to the group, to talk to us. And what he said was pretty fascinating. What, what did he say? So, you know, we expected that he would say, overthrow the government, smash the state, impose fascism. And he did celebrate Tim McVeigh. He celebrated uh, James Alex Fields, the man accused of killing Heather Heyer. He did say, I welcome the chaos. But the thing that he said that surprised us is he said, but you know, I'm sort of reconsidering these days. Um, we have Trump in office now, and I really see Trump as an ally. So 
I don't really know where things are going to go from here. And I'm sort of rethinking my philosophy a little bit. And that surprised us. That was a, a little bit of a shock to us. Uh, AC, very quickly, you have the Thousand Oaks killing of 12 people. That man served in the military. Parkland, he was in Jay Rotsi, the yoga studio killing in Tallahassee. He was um, in the military. Um, in the last 10 seconds we have, um, how do you think this can be dealt with? Yeah, I, you know, I think one key thing is that we're need, we need military authorities to really keep an eye on the types of people coming into the service and the things that they are doing in the service. And we need sort of general thoughtfulness and vigilance on this. I want to thank you so much for being with us. Again, A.C. Thompson, correspondent for Frontline PBS, reporter for ProPublica. His investigation, Documenting Hate, New American Nazis, premieres tonight, Tuesday night, on PBS stations online at pbs.org slash frontline. That does it for our broadcast, Democracy Now!, produced by Mike Burke, Dina Geister, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wells, Tammy Warnoff, Sam Alkoff. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us.